Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop. My name is Luis Mendoza, and I use he, him pronouns. I am a Latino man with black hair, a gray beard, and I wear glasses. Today, I'm wearing a pullover purple v-neck sweater with a gray t-shirt underneath, and I'm coming to you from my home office. And on the wall behind me, you'll see three multicolored feathered Mardi Gras masks. I work for a nonprofit called Kindering, where I run a program called the Washington State Fathers Network, which supports men who have a child in their, in their life with special health care needs. And I'm also a member of the uh, steering committee for the Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Before we get started with our presentation, there are a few slides that I'd like to run through with you. First, because we are committed to making our events accessible, I want to cover the, the information on the first slide. If you go back, please. Uh, on this slide, it mentions that live captioning is available. If you click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and then show subtitle, if you want to view captions via a separate window or different device, click on the link that's been provided in the chat window. Please the, use the Q&A function for questions. We will answer as many as possible in the allocated time. If you're having technical challenges, indicate so in the chat box and a, a, a team member will offer their support. As a reminder, this workshop is an hour and a half with a brief break midway through. With this slide, I officially welcome you. We are very excited to have you here at this workshop on successful accessibility and inclusion and inclusive design integration presented by the Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium. This slide contains the language of our land acknowledgement which is that we would like to acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the unceded and traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples and that we occupy this land. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but serves as a first step in honoring the land that we are on. This next slide covers our shared agreements, which are that this is a safe space we respect all efforts to work on accessibility issues in your organization. The fact that you are here is a big deal. We recognize that each organization is at varying levels of accomplishment with accessibility. We are here to help and not to judge. We are diligent in studying and researching our resources and are interested in learning about those we may have missed. This slide is a thank you to our sponsors. Uh, these workshops are made possible by generous donors and sponsors. And today's sponsors are the Hearing Loss Association of America and Arts Washington. On this slide, we show the logos for those two organizations. On the left is the logo for the Hearing Loss Association of America, Washington State Association which is a graphic of three people, purple, green, and orange. And they are next to the capitalized purple letters H-L-A-A. -A. On the right-hand side of the screen is the logo for Arts Washington, which is a geometric pattern composed of multicolored shapes with Arts Wa in the middle in white capitalized letters. This next slide provides an overview of today's program. In a moment, we'll have an introduction to the Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium by its founder, Elizabeth Ralston, after which we'll go into act one of our presentation, which will be three representatives from local organizations discussing their work in accessibility and inclusion. This will be followed by a brief two minute intermission on coming back from intermission, we'll go into act two, which will be a discussion on strategies in integrating accessibility and inclusive work, followed by act three, which will be observations from Smithsonian Access. 
access. Uh, then we'll have time for some question and answers and I'll return then and wrap things up. As we go to this next slide, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Elizabeth Ralston, who is the founder of the Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's great to see so many people here. Excited to have you. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ralston, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a white woman with short wavy silver hair, and I'm wearing a shawl, a blue shawl, and am standing up in a virtual background. On the left, you can see the SCAC logo, which is made of several horizontal lines with varying thicknesses, lengths, and shades of blue on top of a ramp sloping upwards on one side. And on the other side, you see consortium workshop. So, the consortium was founded in 2018 with the mission of connecting arts and cultural organizations with information and resources to improve accessibility for people of all abilities. If you are aiming for inclusion and welcoming of everyone, access needs to be part of that. And we are fiscally sponsored by Sunpike. And um, the Sunpike logo on the right had the word powered by in a half circle over the letters Sunpike. I want to give a shout out to my steering committee and um, everyone who has helped put this together. It's real teamwork. Um, and thank you to the panelists um, and the moderator and everyone else who is participating in this. The next slide states that the Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium asked that you consider making a donation to support our mission and future workshops. Together, we can increase accessibility. And um, the link to this is going to be posted in the chat. So please take a moment to um, give some of yourself to this. Thank you so much. Together, we can increase accessibility. This slide states the goals of the workshop. Our goal is to learn how arts organizations have integrated accessibility into their, work, into their programs, what has worked well and what the opportunities are. Um, we want to gain new ideas and strategies for incorporating accessibility into your work plan. So with that, um, I know that you're eager to hear from um, these wonderful panelists um, that we have here today. So, this next slide, um, I'm going to introduce Vivian Phillips. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to her, and she's our moderator today. Vivian and I met in 2015 when I was in an interim leadership position at a dance organization, and right away I was struck by her magnetism. Vivian Phillips is a veteran communications professional and arts leader. Vivian's career spans radio and television broadcast, independent theater and television producing, teaching arts and communications management and consulting, performance art curating and arts policy advocacy. Vivian has served in numerous leadership roles in government and nonprofit and has been a strategic advisor and consultant on many projects across Washington and Oregon. She is currently the, the chair for the Seattle Arts Commission. She leads for culture as president of the board and serves on the boards of KUOW slash NPR and the U University of Washington Foundation. So with that, I'm pleased to welcome Vivian Philip to this. So Vivian, you can now, yeah, there you are, take it away. Thank good you. Good morning, good morning. It is so good to be here, thank you. And I just need to make one correction. I didn't catch this earlier. I am no longer the chair of the Seattle Arts Commission. In fact, I've not been on the Seattle Arts Commission since 2017, but it just seems to be part of my DNA. So it gets attached to me. Uh, I am an African-American woman. My skin color is about caramel brown. I'm wearing a 
sunshine gold sweater this morning to uh, welcome the sun. And I also am wearing black rim glasses. My hair is salt and pepper and it's very short. I'm coming to you this morning from my home office. And what you see behind me is a gold banner that has Adinkra symbols from the West African Akan people, along with a few photographs on the um, wall, a filing cabinet, and three tulips. So I'm really, really happy to be with you this morning. A hundred years ago, I worked for an organization called Community Services for the Blind. And I think that's where I first learned a bit about the necessity of accessibility. And so I'm eager to learn with you all this morning. So let me start by introducing our panelists. First up is Patty Liang, and Patty is the executive director of Deaf Spotlight, which oversees artistic and cultural programming to support deaf artists and their work. Throughout her career, Patty has pursued opportunities that encourage the deaf community to embrace and also celebrate the arts. She has a BFA in ceramics from the University of Washington and an MA in nonprofit management for the arts from NYU, New York University. Patty believes that everyone has the ability to create and express their story through art. Next, I'm happy to introduce <clears throat> We can go to the next slide. Thank you. Ah, I see. All right. Well, I think um, let's go ahead and have Patty come on screen. And Patty, you can tell us about your project and your organization and what worked and demonstrated uh, as a demonstration of accessibility and inclusion work. Welcome, Patty. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I look forward to working with you today and talk about our organization. It's quite close to my heart. My name is Patty. I'm an Asian American woman. I have brown hair and I'm currently wearing a bun on my head. I'm standing in front of a teal blue wall with a blue shirt on. Before we go ahead and talk about some of the slides that I have for you, I want to do a polite reminder that accessibility requires funds and time. There's no question about this. So please consider that because our organization, being an artist-centered organization, puts that as our top priority and one of our primary focuses. All of the planning of our events, the welcoming of the audience, down to how we involve the audience and so forth keeps that primary in our mind. Our audience is primarily composed of deaf individuals, deaf-blind individuals, hard of hearing individuals, and others with disabilities. That is the bulk of our audience. We do have what we call a secondary audience. Those are hearing individuals or maybe ASL students, you know, people learning sign language, uh, sign language interpreters, hearing peers, and other non-deaf individuals who are colleagues or just can, uh, curious about our organization and what we do. So all of those people have to be welcome to our events. And how we accomplish all of this is that we get to know who our audience is. How we welcome our audience into the facility, how they get here, how they participate is primary in our mind. For sake of example, we take accessibility requests. Then we double check with their accessibility requests because we take this very close to heart. We want to know exactly what they need to best serve them because we want to support our audience. Accessibility is built into our budget at every level, whether it's meetings, operations, workshops, or what have you. We want to make sure we are accessible at all levels to everyone. When an individual contacts us, though, and asks for specific accessibility, we will uh, get clarification about what they need if required because we want to make sure we fit their needs. These people know what their accessibility requirement is and what works for them. 
I mean, <laughs> we don't know that. So we encourage all of you to consider hiring experts, such as transcriptioners, sign language interpreters, people to make transcripts and so forth. If you don't know uh, how to do that yourself, there are plenty of resources out there and we're happy to help you with that, as well as the SCAC. We're here for you. Also, people definitely need to be flexible and we need to be patient. We have to understand that this is a learning process for all of us. And, you know, the first time that you do an event, it might be a little shaky, but that's okay. Practice makes perfect. And when it comes to accessibility, you need that practice. I'd like to give you an example of what we do. I have two slides here coming up for you. And I want to show you uh, what we do with these slides from our perspective. For sake of example, this one slide, you'll see a wall that is that has teal colored toilet paper in diagonal lines. That is an event announcing our play festival coming up in April. We have a visual description on this slide, as well as what we call alternative images because we want to make sure that these images are available to all of our audience, whether they can uh, read the description in, in Braille or see the picture themselves. We also have another picture, which is a GIF. And right now it's frozen, but it does move when it's on social media. It's uh, an example of where you can go to get our early duck tickets and where it's available. It's a picture of a duck in a bubble bath saying you can get uh, early duck tickets. See, it's a play on words, not early bird tickets, early duck tickets. But and from now until March 14th, tickets are at a discount price of $15. We included an announcement at the bottom of that slide, as well as a link directly to the Play Festival. There's another example here, and that's of a YouTube video. We have added captioning along the bottom. There is no voice on this YouTube video. We primarily use American Sign Language as our primary mode of communication. So the captioning is merely there for audiences, members who don't know sign language, but want to know about our organization. So the transcript is put there for them. We also include a visual description within the transcripts because we want, again, we want to make sure that every individual has uh, a clear understanding of what's going on which is why we also put our presenters in front of a solid color wall. So it's easier on the eyes and easier to follow the sign language. This is the first time we've hosted this event virtually. And so there's a lot of a learning curve going on, but we wanted to make sure that everybody in our audience felt warm, invited and comfortable. For sake of example, we had established a, um, how do I want to say this? A media release form because we work with artists now all over the United States, which is awfully cool. I mean, because of COVID, it provided us a unique opportunity to figure out how to hire various artists and work with a variety of people uh, from all over. I mean, working with various actors and so forth. So for our performers, we have a separate form for them where we ask them their name, their preferred pronouns. Then we also ask them for a headshot and a a description of who they are. We have them describe themselves because we want them to feel empowered to say who they are. We don't want to be making assumptions of who they are. So we just take the information they send to us and we download it into our advertisements. So the last comment is that I want you all to think about planning accessibility from the get-go because planning accessibility at all levels requires time and to make the audience feel uh, accepted and included means that we have to start from the very planning sessions and go from there thank you so much for your time thank you so much patty i um my immediate takeaway is that it takes time and it takes resources be patient 
but stay with it. Thank you so very much. That was really helpful. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce Laura Ferry. Laura is an independent theater artist with extensive professional experience as an actor, director, and playwright. Laura is also skilled at devising innovative performing pieces. And Laura is most recently, has most recently collaborated with Anything is Possible Theater on their original musical, Flying Blind. Welcome, Laura. And we are looking forward to hearing from you. What are uh, some of the projects and things that have worked and lessons learned about inclusion and accessibility? Thank you, Vivian. Next slide, please. I'm speaking on behalf, my name is Laura Ferry, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Anything Is Possible Theater. I am a white woman with short blonde hair. I have a moss green sweater on and green glasses, green earrings, and a green necklace. Yes, I like green. Behind me is a kind of a busy wall with uh, old projects that my daughter made, um, uh, school projects. So it's kind of a, a creative stimulating space. So I'm here to speak about my project, um, Flying Blind, that is in coordination with the Anything is Possible Theater. It's an audio play by, for, and about the blind and low vision community performed by blind, visually impaired, and sighted actors. And this slide shows our production poster, which is has the title of the show, uh, Flying Blind, on a light gray screen that fades to black with images of birds in flight. At the very bottom of the uh, lower right hand corner is the Any Anything is Possible logo and our sponsor uh, for culture. Next slide, please. So I'm going to discuss now our flying blind research and development. So this project was created to honor and to celebrate the blind and visually impaired, the BVI community, giving voice to their stories. So in order to do that, we worked with our blind consultant, Sherry Richardson, who introduced us to multiple BVI organizations all over King County. So we had a deep immersion into the BVI community. We attended conferences, book clubs, athletic events such as Ski for Light and Beatball. We conducted targeted workshops such as uh, guide dog users and parent use, you know, parents of children who are blind. We had multiple interviews with diverse range of BVI individuals and our script and our songs were vetted by our consultant at every step of the way. So that's an important part of this project is constantly working with the, the BBI community and getting their feedback on everything that we did. Uh, next slide, please. So this was the big one, accessibility in rehearsal. Once COVID hit, because we planned to do this as a live production, we had to pivot to an audio play. So I took the script, which was an hour and a half long, and edited it down to a much shorter script with a much smaller cast because we had to work with a local recording studio for COVID protocol. So in the end, we only had seven uh, BVI actors and two sighted actors. That was the number that could safely work in this recording studio with everybody having their own space. During rehearsal, we tailored accessibility needs for each individual. So that meant that for some of my actors, they wanted a braille script. Some actors wanted a large font script. Um, I provided a lot electronic Word documents that could be used with screen readers, such as JAWS or voiceover for actors who wanted that. And for some actors, and some of my actors did not have access to computers, we provided um, pre-recorded audio CDs of their dialogue and their music. So we rehearsed over Zoom. Actors who did not have access to computers or and did not have long distance on their phones would call in on a regular phone and then I would kind of place the phone next to the computer and we would all on speaker and we would all kind of work together. During rehearsal, uh, the BBI actors constantly provided feedback, they collaborated, we incorporated some of their stories and the script evolved to suit and meet their needs. Next slide, please. 
so then we, um, this is our Flying Blind recording at the Jack Straw Cultural Center. And this slide includes some photos of our work at the studio. So starting from the bottom left and moving up to the right, we have a, a photo of two women in the recording studio standing in front of a microphone and a music stand. Um, our next slide has our two, um, uh, in the, we had a blind twins, Dave and Dan, and they are standing in front of um, music stands and microphones in the studio. Next, we have Fiona, um, one of our uh, blind actors, had her guide dog with her, and he, she was just hanging out during the recording very patiently. And then um, the last photo is of our audio engineer, uh, Joel Maddox, adjusting the microphone of one of our actors, Hannah, in another space. So during this recording, we followed COVID protocol. And so the actors, as I mentioned, were separated and, and felt safe in the space. We added extra light for the low vision actors. And we also provided special tables for the braille readers because we realized that they could not use music stands. They needed to have a, a flat surface rather than a raised surface. We staggered the call to preserve actors' energies, and we compensated the cast for their work, which was a, a very big deal to them to be compensated. Next slide, please. We had a preview performance um, of the show for the cast and an invited audience of about 50. The response was overwhelmingly positive. People were, were thrilled to hear the production. Um, we plan to do a large scale public live stream at the end of the month, and then the audio play will be available for on demand screening by April. Next slide, please. And so I'm going to conclude um, with a little taste of our production. So this slide has our title, Flying Blind, and credits. The music and lyrics for this section of the song were by Kathleen Tracy. The lead vocals are Jennifer Lund, and the backup vocals are Dan Ortner, Jerry Takens, and Kathleen Tracy. So this is just a part of the song, um, but I thought it was a piece that would speak to all, all disabilities. So Jason, if you wouldn't mind pressing that audio button and thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you. Please don't tell me that I'm an inspiration. Just for getting out the door today. Can you see that? The main obstacle's not what I can't see, but a society that's not set up for people like me. Cause I can see my own horizon. I've learned how to drive. You might think it's a disaster. I just call it flying blind. Who count to matters? Who count to matters? Think about it. Who count to matters? Who counts who matters? Can you see me? Or do you think it's inconvenient? You may be one of us someday. That is beautiful. Thank you so very, very much. Um, I, I mean, my breath is taken away by this. And one of the reasons is because um, if there is a benefit of COVID, it's that it has broken down barriers and we can actually cross worlds and have a little bit more opportunity to experience one another in, um, in our deepest way. So thank you so very, very much. That was great, super. All right, it's my pleasure now to introduce Annie Jankovic. Uh, she is a multiply disabled actor, director, and all around theater artist, my favorite kind of theater artist. <laughs> she received her BFA in theater performance from Central Washington University. And Annie has been working as the accessibility coordinator for Sound Theater Company since November of 2019. Welcome, Annie. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Annie Jankovic. My pronouns are she, her. I am a pale white woman with long, uh, straight brown hair, black glasses, 
and I am wearing a red sweater with white stripes and a black blazer. I am sitting in a white room in front of a brown door and a painting of a sunset that I did. I'm really excited to be here for you. Uh, I've been the accessibility coordinator with Sound Theater since November 2019. And my role is essentially to cover all things disabled access. I advise on shows and events for how to make things accessible and to cover anything that may be forgotten because as we all should know, disability is very vast and incredibly varied. So it can be really hard for one person to catch everything. So I tend to be there to help be that theoretical disabled eyes and ears for everything that we do to make sure it's as equitable as possible. Um, we have been exclusively in digital space since March of last year. Um, we have, thought then and still think now we don't want to create a space where we couldn't have chronically ill people in our audience because I know some people have been discussing how to do in person but smaller or differently and we are still sticking to the thought that if chronically ill people can't be there um, it's not an equitable environment. Um, we have had to adapt our former 20 to 20, 21 season for our current format. Since the pandemic began, we've reformatted Changer and the Star People by Fern Renville and Roger Fernandez to Changer the Radio Play, which we put up in the fall. We're currently in rehearsal for our reformatted The Mad Woman of Chaillot by Jean Garadeau. And you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is our photo from Changer. Here we have a poster for Changer, the radio play. Uh, it is a blue poster with photos of birds and fish in the background. In the center is um, in, the, in a Pacific Northwest indigenous art style, a face that's half blue, half white. Underneath it says Changer, the radio play. And next to it, we've got a photo of seven indigenous actors sitting together on concrete steps outside who are close together and smiling for the camera. And this was our cast of Changer the Radio Play. Um, this is the first reformatted show we completed. In adapting to a radio play, we had to consider how to make it accessible for people who rely on visuals. So we ended up making a captioned video version as well as creating and releasing a transcript of the show alongside the audio. Um, and the transcript was fun and also a little hard because it's similar to a traditional script, but not exactly the same. And there's some things that need to be different, um, but that was really fun to get to create. I'm excited to make the transcript for Mad Woman. And these multiple formats help cover our bases for different needs of different people. Some pe for some people, a transcript is more useful than captions. For some people, captions are more useful than interpreters. Part of my job is making sure that we're trying to cover not just one kind of disability, but doing what we need to to make things accessible for lots of different kinds of people. And very often that means creating multiple versions or multiple spaces rather than trying to make one space perfectly accessible because with the competing accessibility needs that's not really possible. Um, you can go to the next slide please. This is a good example of that. We did a uh, an event that was a viewing and discussion of the Sins and Ballad documentary An Unashamed Claim to Beauty in the Face of Invisibility. This photo is a poster of that event. It is the title of the documentary as well as Crossroads in Theater. And it says documentary viewing and panel discussion. And it's a photo of a person in a wheelchair hanging upside down in front of a blue background. Um, one of the things we had to do for this event was figuring out a way to make things um, accessible for both uh, blind low vision people and people with auditory processing attention disorders because there was an audio described version of the documentary, but the documentary itself comes with captions and the audio described version, um, the captions do not reflect what's being described. 
And so we were thinking of showing that version, but if we were to show that for anyone who has auditory processing issues, which is why they use captions, I'm one of those people, um, but if you can still have some hearing, it can be really jarring to not be seeing and hearing the same thing. So we had to figure out a way. What we ended up doing was offering access to the audio described version and showing the version with captions. And we gave a timeline breakdown of when we'd be doing things and gave ourselves a break. So if anyone needed to go uh, watch and listen to the audio described version, they could and they wouldn't be missing anything in our panel. So it's things like that that I do a lot um, for this particular project. I also was um, one of the people creating trigger warnings, which to me is access. I find it ridiculous when people act like it's not. Um, and so that's a lot of what I do uh, with sound theater is those kinds of things, as well as working in um, with our weekly staff meetings and any other events we might do like our gala that is coming up on March 27. It will be the second digital gala uh, we've done. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this is a photo of the cast and crew of the Mad Woman of Shio. It is a screenshot of a diverse group of 28 people on a Zoom call, all smiling towards the camera. Um, right now, we are in rehearsal for our production of the Mad Woman of Shio, which was going to be our big summer production um, in person when we were planning it. So it's been a bit of a bigger beast and a different challenge than adapting to a radio play, because this is still going to be a digital performance uh, with visuals. And we've been working with integrating uh, some things that we're doing for this production. We're integrating signing ASL into the production, which Sound Theater has done in the past with examples like um, our ASL production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. We are also going to have captions. It will be a video, captions throughout the entire video. I will be creating a transcript for this production. And we have a bigger crew this time for things like we have a director of artistic sign language and an assistant director of artistic sign language. And we have interpreters at every rehearsal. Um, the thing I'm most excited about for Mad Woman that we're trying out this time is what we've been calling our non-oppressive rehearsal schedule. Um, our rehearsal calendar started in February for a show that goes up at the end of May. We've scheduled a lot of time in for overflow in case there are things that we don't get to when they're initially scheduled. We also have certain people joining the process later because of when they'll realistically be needed. The idea is that we give ourselves a leisurely amount of time to rehearse and prepare the show, not only to cover if anything goes wrong, but also to preserve people's limited energy by not making it a pedal to the metal process for weeks on end, which is what big productions tend to be. This is something I'm really excited about as a disabled person with fluid disabilities, I'm chronically ill, and it can be really hard to listen to your body and do what you need to do for yourself when you know everyone is on a crunched timeline and if you take a break or have to miss a rehearsal, it can put the whole show in jeopardy. So we're hoping to do away with that idea that we can do things at a pace that lets us preserve our limited energy and capacity, which I think it's safe to say people don't have a lot of that these days. Um, we also have a policy of mercy and grace for these rehearsals, which I wish more people had. We encourage people to, if they, if they need to sit during rehearsal, even if they'll be standing during the show, they can keep their cameras off for a day if they have to, even if their cameras will be day on during the show. So we've been trying really hard to me to make an equitable process for disabled cast members. You have to start dismantling the whole established process of theater because right now it's very push yourself till you break and you're not gonna have disabled people in your process if you do that. And that is the end for me. Thank you very much. Oh, Annie, I just learned so much. Um, so I've only performed in a couple of productions and that whole mercy and grace policy is a new thing for me. <laughs> and I also love, love, love the non-oppressive rehearsal schedule. That's something that uh, regardless of what the, the theater company is or what it does should be embraced. I really appreciate that. 
Okay, well, one of the things that we absolutely believe in is providing mercy and grace. Uh, and so uh, we are going to get to that. First, I want to introduce someone who will be joining us a little bit later, Beth Zebarth. I hope I said that right. I never know if I should say Z or Zai, um, has a personal interest and professional responsibility in advocacy for people with disabilities. As the director of Access Smithsonian, her work includes policy guidelines, training, technical assistance, accessibility services, outreach, collaboration, and five signature programs for disabled people. Beth is going to join us after we do a little bit of grace and mercy. And that is we're going to take a lesson from dance communities where we don't go quite into intermission but we're just going to take a quick pause. I think we should get water if you need to. Please get up and stretch, go to the restroom. And remember as well when we come back that you can drop your questions into the Q&A. We will be back in just a couple of minutes. See you back here so shortly. And it looks like our two minutes has been exhausted. I think we are back. All right, I'm going to invite um, our panelists to join us now, all on screen, Annie, Patty, Laura, and Beth, even though we will be hearing from you, Beth, a little bit later on, uh, we invite you to participate in this part of the discussion. I first wanna thank you all for sharing the information that you've shared. Um, I have had the great honor of experiencing death spotlight through my association with the Seattle Theater Group, um, have had a chance to see big major productions done in an accessible and all accessibility kind of format. And let me tell you, it was my best experience. I wish they were always that way. Um, I want to uh, pose a question that any or all of you can feel free to answer. And that is what strategies did you use to make your project accessible and inclusive, given the pivot to virtual programming in 2020. Laura, I think we heard a bit about how you all um, transitioned that way, but anyone else have any uh, uh, notes or suggestions or just experiences to share? Beth? 
Can I add something, Vivian? Yes, please. So one of the things that's, I think, so fascinating and interesting about accessibility is once you dive into the pool, you just go down deeper and deeper and deeper. So once we started working with the blind and low vision community, when we started working on our show, we realized that we wanted to make this accessible to the deaf and hard of hearing community. So when this goes live, it will have captions. So we have put in captions for, and we will also provide a transcript for the show. So initially we hadn't thought about that, but then as we dove in, we realized we need to do this. So I think that that is one, one part of the process that's important is that once you start, you start realizing more and more and more things that you need to do. And as we transition into live theater, you know, I, I learned so much already about what you can do to make your website accessible for so many different people by, you know, again, making sure there's descriptions of all, you know, making sure your website is accessible, but also making sure that there's, you know, all descriptions for all your photographs and, and even putting in information on your website about your accessibility accommodation so that people don't have to wonder, well, is it accessible? No, it is. And, and you explain why. So I think that those are things that we, we learned and we're learning. It's not a, an end product, it is a journey. You keep learning more and more and more. And I mean, I actually learned stuff today that I was taking notes about. So thank you, uh, Annie and Patty. So I mean, that's that's one thing I would say. Yeah, I loved that the deaf spotlight uh, visuals had a description of what the visual was. I think um, so often we make an assumption that we're doing something that's easily accessible to everyone. And then we just forget one really, really super important thing that keeps that accessibility from being universal in so many ways. Um, Annie, I wanna ask you specifically, um, how has your role as accessibility coordinator at Sound Theater helped to integrate accessibility across the board? Because I, I feel like it's one of those things where it's like equity and inclusion, right? We like make the plan and then we pop that on top of it. Um, so how has accessibility in that way become more integral to the foundation and every element of the organization? Yeah, um, luckily for us, one of our artistic directors, Teresa Thuman, has been a really big part of this for a while. Um, so by the time I joined, there was already foundational work and things structured in. Um, but one of the things we really try to do is dedicate ourselves to including disabled people where we haven't really been included before. And we try to do that holistically, not just on stage. So a big part of what I do weekly is things with our weekly staff meetings and other meetings that I have with people, um, not even related to the projects. Because uh, we, we have deaf and disabled staff members, production team members, designers, actors, consultants. Um, to me, part of the integration is making sure it's not just on the performance level. Because putting an actor, a disabled actor on stage, but not making the backstage accessible for them and having no disabled you know, directors or designers who can put in that consideration without that disabled actor having to ask for everything. Cause I've been in that position before where things that seem obvious to me, cause I walk in with a cane, um, don't seem obvious to everybody. And so having people at all levels helps integrate equity across the board. Um, also just in positions of power and where people are getting paid, like having an actor be disabled is really great. But if that's your only person, they get, you know, what, a one-time stipend and they have to listen to everybody else and there's not really a lot of autonomy there. So that's one of the big things that we do is, is disabled people throughout the organization. Um, we're really into the phrase, nothing about us without us. And uh, my job, I, I do a lot of like the little things that are easy to forget. I've been working since the pandemic began on making us our website and all our online presences fully uh, blind, low vision accessible, yeah. um, which is something that we hadn't really been doing before, but that we've we've started to work on. Um, so there's lots of like little things 
that I catch because, uh, like I said, disability is huge. It's amorphous. I've had to study like lots of different things that I wouldn't think of because I'm not that disability. Yeah. So that's how we've been working. Yeah. I think it's really interesting because um, uh, my experience has been that people uh, equate accessibility with ADA standards, right? It's like, you gotta have that bathroom or you gotta have you know certain things as opposed to it being integrated completely and thoroughly through organizations. So I'm really appreciative of the work that you are all doing. Patty, I saw that you had your hand up. You wanted to add something, please go ahead. I do appreciate people's time and their comments. One thing I want to acknowledge is 2022 was a weird year. Everything we've been through, I mean, that's a huge deal to everybody being put on pause. And so before we proceed with anything, we wanted to acknowledge that people are staying home and taking care of themselves. I mean, there were so many people without jobs and events, uh, events were canceled. And so our primary concern was recognizing how people survive through this. I mean, within our own program, we want to make sure it survived, but we wanted to make sure that everybody was fine because our staff, our audience were all quite emotional by the events of the past year. And so we also want to make sure to pat ourselves on the back for just making it through all this. Now, there's been a lot of things that have happened regarding race relationships, political events, and so forth over the past year. And I'll tell you, as an Asian American woman who is deaf, when I go out or go into another room, my identity itself changes. And I wanted to recognize that, that our expression is a huge part of who we are. I also want to acknowledge that I come from privilege. I'm educated, I have my family support, and I have the privileges that many other people don't have. So from this organization, we need to figure out how to look at every level of who we are and where we come from and make sure that we represent people well, all the way from our volunteers and our staff and our artists to our administrational level. We wanted to invite in deaf, deaf, blind, hard of hearing individuals and make sure that those individuals feel a part of the contributing art that is going on here. Because it's like Annie said, we have to integrate organizational foundational levels in a thoughtful, considerate manner and figure out, oh boy, how do I word this? As well as plan of how we're going to go forward integrating other artists for, in a way that we can all grow together as people and as an organization. Of course, there's still more dialogue that has to go on of how our creativity can work within this type of organizational structure. I know for us, we collaborated, I mean, when COVID happened, right? We started to collaborate with uh, organizations throughout the United States. We had never previously had that opportunity because we didn't know what was going on in other states. Uh, we were all following the silo effect, you know, but when COVID appeared, we took it as an opportunity to collaborate. For sake of example, we're working with visionaries of the creative arts which is an organization in Washington, D.C., a theater there, and we got together to offer acting classes. We hired BIPOC deaf instructors to come in, and we uh, asked them to teach some acting classes with different themes attached to them. Myself and my peers agreed that there just, frankly, aren't enough BIPOC deaf artists out there. I mean, where's their opportunity to learn and grow? Right? So we are primarily composed of white people offering these workshops, and we acknowledge that there was a gap in the system. And so we wanted to provide panels and workshops and so forth that would provide the opportunities and the knowledge of the people out there to make them feel welcome to participate within our organization, as well as provide tools to those artists to be successful in their future endeavors. There are just plainly not enough BIPOC deaf leaders out there. I think there's maybe five in the country, and there's not that many. We definitely need to build on this and make it an all-inclusive community. Well, I 
am, again, I, I mentioned earlier that one of the benefits that I felt from COVID is that, you know, it, it broke down some barriers to access because geography no longer was an issue. Um, and I want to pose this question with, before we uh, move on to the, the third part of this discussion to everyone. What does your uh, audience development look like now? Um, and because we've had this whole shift to virtual existence in 2020, what does it look like now and how much of that do you think you'll take into the future as, you know, we start to return to what people are calling normal? Um, what, what kind of audience development projects, programs, campaigns do you all envision? And that's open for everybody. How our organization benefited is that we hosted an online support group and it was so nice to meet such a variety of artists from all over. And we continue to do that, we hope, into the future because networking with people it doesn't happen often. It's so wonderful to see and meet other artists, even if it is virtually. At first, we really weren't sure what to do with COVID, you know, because we didn't know how it was going to impact our plans. We knew we couldn't do things in person. So we think going forward with our festival, um, you know, faced with doing it uh, in person or virtual, we think we might do it hybrid because COVID really showed, shown a light on the barriers for artists. Sometimes it's expenses and they can't uh, pay to fly in or there's no access that's provided by different theaters. So we want all of our artists to have this opportunity to be a part of our group. We want equity across the board for everybody. So we're hoping to hire people that we have not yet worked with. Maybe we just overlooked them or um, they're underrepresented, uh, but we would love to work with them in the future in our projects. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? Laura, go ahead. So we, uh, this, so many of the same issues that have been raised that the, the, the switching to virtual has been in some ways a blessing. Yeah. And so we, since we have this virtual product, we are now the same thing, looking at distributing it nationally and reaching groups across, reaching blind groups across the country. And at a certain point, we might even be able to, to, to introduce it to people, you know, internationally as well. I mean, some of the artists that we worked with in our program, one of our women was from Japan, and we interviewed people from many different um, countries about their experiences growing up in different countries and then coming to America and the difference between how the blind and visually impaired are, are treated and taught in, in different countries across the globe. So that is one thing that, you know, we started with just doing thinking we were just going to do a little live theater show that probably would have reached a very small group of people in Seattle. And now the potential is so much wider. And, and I think we're going to continue to keep that virtual component. We still want to do a live show, but now we're thinking, can we take pieces, new pieces and create, you know, more targeted productions, you know, take, these are, th th these are scenes that we feel are really important for people to hear about in the, the workplace. You know, here's a little, all the different things, accommodations, you know, tips for interacting with blind and low vision people. This is a great product for, you know, to, to share with uh, organizations and businesses, you know, parents, uh, both parents of blind and visually impaired um, individuals, but parents themselves who are blind and visually impaired, you know, sharing information with them and, and telling their stories. So I think the virtual component will never go away. It's just yeah. opened our minds. Thank you. Thank you. Annie, go ahead. We've got like a minute left. Go ahead, please. Yeah, we don't have much time, but I want to say something that digital has been able to give us with these more, more um, access avenues like captioning, interpreters, audio descriptions, is that we don't have to live in separate realms of who the play is for. For example, Changer is a Coast Salish story, mm -hmm. but there doesn't have to be a separate circle for indigenous theater and disabled theater. We can do the indigenous show with our new accessibility things that digital provides us. And I think that's been always been possible, but a little easier digitally. 
That's awesome. And I'm, and, you know, I'm just thinking about my life as a, a, a performing arts marketer, that how much it would mean absolutely to have someone on staff that is advising in that way as well. So I, I just really am appreciative of all of your comments and your um, really great tips. I've learned so much and I know everybody else has. Thank you all so very, very much. I wanna remind everyone that you can go ahead and drop your questions in the Q&A box. And at this point, we're gonna pivot over to uh, Beth and learn uh, a bit about the shift to virtual platforms and what success and strategies have been seen as it relates to Access Smithsonian. So thank you so much. I think you all can go off camera and then we'll highlight with Beth. Welcome Beth. You're, you're muted. That's the most popular phase of 2020 and 2021. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we don't have a two minute break at this point. This is our, we dive right in. We're diving right in. Okay, so let me start off by um, giving my pronouns and my description. So my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a disabled white woman. Um, you can potentially see my um, power wheelchair that I'm seated in um, behind me here, my headrest at least. Um, I have shoulder length blonde, gray brown hair <laughs> and glasses. I'm wearing a bright orange shirt today and um, I'm in my living room. Behind me you can see a armoire with some of my um, arts and crafts pottery on top um, and you know kind of oddly you can see my um, my model, um, a, a tactile model of the Jefferson Memorial for a project that I'm working on. Um, so Yes, that's my description. Lovely. Thank you. All right, so I think we need to get my slides up here though. Mm -hmm. And if our producer can put up my slides. There we go. Great, thank you. So as Vivian mentioned, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about um, the programs that we have at um, Access Smithsonian and then draw some parallels to other programs across the country that I have um, learned about, um, discussed with colleagues and um, to share and also talk about um, you know, reopening strategies. So first off, this is a photograph from an in-person program for our Morning at the Museum program. And Morning at the Museum is for families of kids with disabilities. Um, it is a program where we open the museum one hour early uh, or one and a half hours early before the general public comes in and we invite uh, families to participate. We keep a, um, a reservation system in place so that we can limit the number of people who um, participate because what we're trying to do is achieve a you know, better um, environment um, that will be useful for kids with a variety of disabilities, in particular brain-based disabilities. And um, this slide is a red-haired, freckle-faced boy in a blue jacket and wearing noise-canceling headphones, stares intently at an aquarium tank filled with coral and tropical fish as he leans on an exhibition label rail surrounding the tank. So when COVID-19 hit and we moved into um, closing the museums and developing online programs, I think initially there was fear that we were not gonna be able to do some of our programs anymore um, until we could do in-person again once museums reopened. But 
you know, with a little creative thought, we could um, modify the programs. And with Morning at the Museum, what we did is initially um, we talked with, surveyed the families who participate in Morning at the Museum. We have about 2,000 families who are active um, in participating in Morning at the Museum, uh, which is offered once a month, typically um, at all of our, each of our museums at the Smithsonian, and we have 19 museums in the zoo, take turns um, hosting. And so the family said that, you know, that all of this emphasis on their kids being online and using Zoom meant that they were not all that interested in um, really doing programs um, <laughs> online and Zoom. But um, we've tried something. Um, well, first off, we, we sent out lists weekly um, to the families of different opportunities that are available at the Smithsonian and elsewhere. Um, and that's what they had really requested. It's kind of like a roundup of what was available so that they could choose you know, what might provide some added benefit to their families um, you know, beyond schoolwork. And then the museum started really focusing on family programs online. And we decided that we could do a, a um, morning at the museum um, kind of emphasis with some of these programs or all of the programs where we would invite morning at the museum families to participate. Um, and they would, you know, we would help the staff member at a museum who was hosting a family program modify their um, materials, like their PowerPoints, so that they would be um, successful with kids with a variety of disabilities, and also think through the activities. And we'd send out the um, activity instructions in advance. So the first one that we held, which was recently, was with the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the National Museum of Asian Art. They were doing a joint program. And um, the focus was on an activity, uh, making your own wearable art. And the theme was how museums conserve art. So um, taking the abstract of conservation and museums to um, a project where kids can make their own wearable art and think about how, um, how durable that kind of thing might be. And, um, and that was very successful. Uh, so we're going to host probably four more of these, um, these programs in the near future with different museums and the zoo. And families did tell us that they're interested in zookeeper talks um, or any kind of tour of a museum. And then they're interested in the activities um, and much less interested in just trying to replicate a morning at the museum program online. So we needed to modify what we were doing. And I've heard about how other museums are doing similar things like the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago is, um, is doing something very similar where they're doing keeper talks um, and families are very interested in them. Next slide. Another example is our um, See Me at the Smithsonian program for individuals with dementia and their care partners. This slide shows two museum docents standing next to a large square landscape painting as they point out details to the older adults seated in front of it. The landscape depicts swooping birds and leaves above tall slender trees surrounding a golden lake. Our CME programming um, is in its second year uh, where we are really um, starting to expand from what we originally um, designed. And that is a program where we would do in-person programs with small groups of individuals with dementia and their care partners in museum galleries, talking about one or two objects during the hour and a half that the, um, the pair were, or dyad as we call them, 
um, would be within the museum. But with COVID, um, we switched to online and originally we thought that the technical part was going to be really challenging, not only on our side um, for hosting this, but also for the, um, the dyads that we wanted to participate in the program. It turns out that that was an incorrect assumption uh, that we quickly learned how to um, use Zoom and its various tools and our access services and could easily do an online program. And it turns out that our um, indig individuals with dementia and their care partners know how to use Zoom very successfully. So it was not a problem to, um, to maintain or even increase our audience. And some of the things that um, we have found is that it is now actually easier um, for a lot of these pairs to be able to participate because they we've taken away some of the barriers to participation. They don't have to worry about transportation, especially parking down at the Smithsonian in downtown DC. They do not need to worry about how to navigate a, an unfamiliar building. Um, they don't have to worry about um, having the, um, the stamina of going around um, the museum because they can participate online. And this is something that you know, we're learning from is that this is, we want to include online programming from now on. Um, we will have in-person programs and we will have online programs. The online programs, currently we do everything for a local Washington metropolitan area audience. But we have the opportunity now that we could make this available to a broader um, audience across the country. And in fact, um, our Smithsonian National Board is very interested in, um, in making this possible for us to do it um, across the country. We have also expanded our um, see me at the Smithsonian program into Spanish language programming. We're training our um, staff and docents to do that now. And we have really emphasized um, community programs in congregate settings. So we have a, um, a program right now where we are working with Mary's House, a, a center um, assisted care facility in DC where um, a large part of the, um, a large number of the residents are people who are LGBTQ um, and BIPOC. And so being able to work with different community organizations and bring the programming to them has been really beneficial. Um, and we had, we're learning, you know, we had heard these things in, um, the media that people who live in congregate settings or older adults living at, um, at home were isolated and experiencing loneliness. And this program um, can really help address some of those problems. We plan to do um, a workshop, what we were talking about in, in Act Two, um, and thinking about how um, you can. Um, expand you know, your, your pro programming. We have a, a membership organization at the Smithsonian for museums called the Smithsonian Affiliates. And so we're gonna do a workshop for Smithsonian Affiliate Museums to introduce them to See Me at the Smithsonian and how to do programming for people with dementia and their, and their care partners and um, especially doing it online. So um, we can tell them about both online and in-person experiences. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, um, Beth, I want to ask you, and there's, there is a question uh, from the Q&A that I want to pose, but one of the things that I just want to observe 
too, is first and foremost, there is nothing like an, a Smithsonian museum experience. There's just nothing like it. Um, and I am aware that particularly the Museum of African American Heritage and Culture, before it was completed, they did online and virtual exhibits and invited their community um, to really be a part of building that museum, which seems like it, it remains a new opportunity for other uh, museums. But the question in the chat is, um, uh, for places like a museum that wants to be inclusive and not just accommodating, the question is, what can we do to go beyond the basic checklist? And while you're answering that, I'm going to invite the rest of the panelists to come back online so that we can go into Q&A. Sure. Go ahead. All right, so I think one of the things that is really important to consider is that you need to um, have organizational buy-in to, um, to accessibility and uh, including disability as part of DEAI, diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. So disability is different than accessibility. Disability is a, an identity um, and Accessibility is the, what I call the mechanics of actually <laughs> providing um, ways for people to participate, um, people who have disabilities. And so having that organizational buy-in and tying this to DEAI efforts is really a good strategy um, because so many museums currently are very focused on what DEAI um, things they're doing. Um, and also, as you know, Patty and some of the other panelists brought up, we need to really be thinking about intersectionality. Um, people with disabilities are not just, you know, I'm not just a wheelchair user. I have a variety of disabilities that I may or may not surface to um, everybody, but it is something that um, has to be recognized and added into that whole DEAI equation. I love it. I love it. It's like we, we, we've also shifted from just STEM to STEAM. So it's now science, technology, uh, engineering, arts, and math. And so now we need to be thinking about going from diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Mm -hmm. That is a perfect, perfect um, prompt for all of us who work within or arts organizations. I'm hopeful that before we end, I get to hear a little bit more about that Jefferson um, Memorial. <laughs> uh, I, I'm hopeful, but right now I'm going to move on to um, some questions. And I want to start with this particular question because it's, it's of interest to me as well. The question is, we're doing some website updates. Can you recommend links to resources to help guide the work or to make the website more accessible? Anyone have any um ideas that they want to share about that mm -hmm. yeah um i know the perkins school for the blind has a lot of uh links on their website for this specific um question i also uh i forget what it is i have access to a pdf of poster sets that gives advice on website design for different disabilities um if the person wanted to uh, email me <laughs> You can email me at access at soundtheatercompany.org. Super. Anyone else have a, a recommendation for a resource? I do. Oh. Um, I'll add in that what's really important is for everybody to understand that there are guidelines out there for website development. Um, so look to the W3C, which stands for the World Wide Web Consortium and they have web content accessibility guidelines or the WCAG. And so if you are designing a website or remediating a website, you should be really addressing those WCAG guidelines because that makes all the difference in the world in terms of whether somebody with a disability can access your website. Awesome. Thank you. Um, a quick note, this is from actually Elizabeth, and I, I'm, I'm going to throw this out here because it's really of interest to me. One of the reasons that 
I don't even use the raise hand um, function on Zoom is because I can't find the right color. Um, and her question is, what do you do about captioning that's not accurate? Um, there's a note that says she's tried streamer and just updated to Rev, but it's still not great. We had a recent comment that the closed captioning is racist because it only describes clearly people who speak English in a certain dialect. And these people tend to be from white communities. Um, any comments or uh, you know responses to that? Yeah, go ahead, Beth. I'll start, and then hopefully everybody will add in. Um, I think that the the best practice is for people to use live captioning, you know, a real time um, captioning um, service for online programs. I know it's a little more expensive to do it that way, but it, you're going to increase your accuracy. Um, and that um, with the different platforms, you have to really look at in terms of um, online programs, Zoom, Teams, WebEx, and you know all the different ones that you can potentially use. You have to really look at how well they have integrated captioning into that platform. Um, there is a woman who um, I've presented with a couple times now in the past year who is really excellent at and knowledgeable about all of the <laughs> ins and outs of different platforms and um, captioning. Her name is Tina Childress, C-H-I-L-D-R-E-S-S. -S, and she has a, um, an organization where she is, um, it's for, um, it's an organization for people who are deaf or have hearing loss. And, um, you know, her information, I think, is really um, very useful. I wonder if anybody has had any interaction with outreach from or uh, contact with uh, organizations or co corporations like Zoom where we've become so dependent upon their services to you know, encourage them or work with them to be more accessibly um, uh, vibrant, for lack of a better word. Go ahead, Laura. It is really difficult to communicate with Zoom. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the license you have, you, you literally cannot call them. So for example, uh, an accessibility issue that I ran into with Zoom is that the call-in numbers for people who live in Seattle were long distance. All the numbers were long distance numbers. And I had BVI actors who didn't have long distance on their phone. They could not access that long distance number to call into Zoom. And so I just had them you know, call on, I had them call me and I put the phone up on speaker. But unless you have a higher you know, subscription for Zoom, you, you can't talk to an individual. All you get is a bot. And when I put in information, I got I got nowhere. So I think the organizations that you have to have a, you know, people who have a higher, you know, people who are doing webinars and are paying more money for their Zoom account would have a better opportunity to interact with people at Zoom than, you know, smaller companies that just have a, you know, small business license. Well, we need to maybe advocate um, to Zoom for, for some of that sensibility. I want to um, move to Patty. I think Patty had a comment that she wanted to share. Go ahead, Patty. Yes, I do. We do have our content that's recorded. We have different individuals on the screen who are signing and they are not live because we need to prepare our accessibility for these videos. We have a deaf individual who films themselves. Then we ask them who the preferred interpreter is, who we bring in to do the voiceover for the video. Then uh, we bring in our volunteers as well as some paid interpreters to come and help out with the captioning because it's rather time consuming. And when we're done with that, we use a system called OBS, Open Broadcast Software. It's a free software online. We upload the video, then we have the voice interpretation embedded into the video file. Then we download the whole kit and caboodle to YouTube. And in YouTube, they have the auto caption feature, which we utilize 
to use the to input the captioning however it is not perfect and there's some stuff that's messed up or missing so we do have to do some editing of the auto captioning and when we are done with that component we save the file and we use that file to upload it to Facebook or social media or what have you. We can also download it to get uh, a transcript where we include our visual description for deafblind individuals. And that whole process takes time. One of my pet peeves is podcasts. So many people are talking about podcasts and how cool it is, and there's a lot of content out the, there in the world about podcasts, but none of this is accessible to me because there's no transcripts. Podcasts might have video and captioning attached to it, but most do not. It's audio only. For sake of example, there's something called the Black Cancer Podcast by Jody Ann Burry, and this podcast has a transcript all the time because they have a team of volunteers who work with a transcriber to make it happen. They have the podcast component, which is audio, put together with the transcription component, which makes it accessible to not only me, but people who don't have the time to listen to podcasts but can read faster. I encourage all of you to consider social media for a minute. All of the recording, all the streaming and so forth that happens on social media, rarely does it have captioning. So we encourage you to think about your Instagram or your TikTok accounts where you can post your videos. There are apps built into these social media outlets that can add captioning for you. That way, all of your audience can follow your social media posts. Thank you so much. I think there are a couple of questions that we didn't quite get to, but I do believe that there will be a follow-up from Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium to provide some additional resources for anyone that wants them or needs them. Um, I just have learned so much today. This has been so full and so very, very enlightening. I wanna thank every single panelist. And I also wanna thank all of the organizers. Shouts out to everyone for making this happen from everyone from Elizabeth all the way through and including all of the interpreters. And it has just been my absolute pleasure to be here. So I wanna say a final thank you and turn it over to Lewis. Thank you so much, Lewis. Hello again, this is Lewis Mendoza speaking. Um, as we come to the end of our workshop, I want to thank um, all of you for joining us. And I want to cover some information in the last two slides of the uh, PowerPoint. Um, there are a lot of um, links that are provided on these last two slides, but don't worry about capturing them now because hopefully you've seen that uh, this slide deck was sent to you in an email yesterday. What this slide says is that a recording of this workshop will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. That we very much would love to have your feedback on the workshop and a link is provided so that you can fill out a survey. Uh, this link will also be sent to you in a follow up email after this workshop. We are committed to keeping our programs free and donations help us to sustain this effort. A link is provided where you can make a donation and we make a suggestion of $20, of a $20 donation for this workshop. Next slide, please. On this last slide, um, links are provided for how to find us on Facebook, how to find us on YouTube and subscribe to our channel and how to, find us, uh, how to find our website. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to all the panelists and to Vivian. Uh, we appreciate your interest in accessibility and your efforts regarding that. And we look forward to having you uh, at our next event. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Goodbye.